In chapter 7, we're going to be taking a look at some integration applications that we haven't seen yet. Unlike the rest of this chapter, in this first lesson for chapter 7, we're going to revisit the idea of finding area. Um, back in chapter 4, we were always finding the area between a curve and the x-axis. The only difference here in 7.1 is we're going to attempt to find the area of a region between two curves. Okay, so let's revisit this idea of finding the area between a curve and the x-axis before we move on to finding the area between two curves. What we saw back in chapter 4 is that a definite integral can be used to calculate the area between a curve and the x-axis on any given interval. The way we kind of visualize that is we uh, understood that we were trying to add up the area of an infinite amount of rectangles. To find the area of a rectangle, of course, that's just the height times the base. And when we use this integral symbol, we're saying that we're adding up an infinite amount of items. And of course, the items here are the areas of these rectangles from A to B. So how do we find the area of these rectangles? Well, it's the height times the base. The height of these rectangles is given by the function uh, that we're using. Here, it's this red function. The base of these rectangles is just a little change of x, which we call dx. And once we plug those two things in for h and b, you can see the definite integral form that we all saw back in chapter 4. And we again knew that this was another way of saying to find the area between the curve and the x-axis from a to b. Okay, so that was our quick review there. But what's going to change in this chapter? The only thing changing here in 7.1 is instead of the x-axis being the bottom of our area, now we have another function. That's the bottom of our area. The top blue function I'm going to call f. The bottom red function I'm going to call g. And I'm going to draw in that rectangle again just to kind of help us out with our little discussion here. And again, that rectangle is standing in place of the infinite amount of rectangles. We usually call this rectangle uh, the representative triangle. I'm sorry, not triangle, rectangle. So it's called the representative rectangle. It represents one of the infinite amount of rectangles. And again, it's going to kind of help us visualize uh, what's going on here um, when we're trying to set up these problems. And really, the setup is the key to all these problems. OK, so that's our representative rectangle. So. Luckily, the base is still the same of this rectangle. It's a little change of x, or dx. So how do we find the height of this rectangle? Well, from before, it was just given by the function. The height of that rectangle uh, was determined by the function, f. In this kind of a problem, how do we find the length of that uh, rectangle, or the distance between the function f and g? Well, luckily, that's just a simple matter of geometry. We need to take that top function and subtract away that bottom function and that'll give us that distance between the two functions. Once we know that, it's a matter of just setting up this integral. The area of a rectangle is still the base times the height. The base is dx, the height is f of x minus g of x, and that's how we find the area between two curves. So really not much of a difference in a sense. And to even point out uh, something more, this concept we've really been doing since chapter 4. I just really never mentioned it. You'll notice that when we set up this integral from a to b of f of x dx, we were actually subtracting away a bottom bound. Not sure you ever realized it, but the bottom function here is our x-axis, or a y value of 0. So we've actually been using this idea of finding the area between two curves really since chapter 4. It's just that back in chapter 4, our bottom function was the x-axis, or 0. So we didn't really need to put minus 0. That would have kind of just been more confusing to do that. But now in this chapter, our x-axis isn't the bottom of our area. So now we do need to subtract away some other function. OK. so. I guess this could be the formula you attempt to memorize or uh, use when you're doing these problems, but I don't think that's the best way to approach uh, this topic. I think the best way to approach this topic is just using some words here. 
I think the best way to kind of remember this idea is to think about it this way. We're integrating from some left bound to some right bound of a top function minus a bottom function. Because, of course, the top function isn't always going to be f, and the bottom function isn't always going to be g. So hopefully that will kind of help you remember it a little bit better. But ultimately, let's see if we can apply this now. We need to find the area between the curve x squared plus 4 and x minus 2 between negative 1 and 3. The key to doing these problems successfully is to get a good graph of what's going on. The better off uh, or the better looking the sketch of your graph is, the easier it's going to be to tell how to set up these problems. And the setup is really everything when you're doing these problems. So here you can see our area. And I'm going to go ahead and draw again that representative rectangle, just again as a reminder of what's going on. It's one of an infinite amount of rectangles, and it's also going to help us identify the top function and the bottom function. The top function is whatever the top of the rectangle is touching. The bottom function is whatever the bottom of the rectangles, rectangle is touching. So how are we going to set this up? Well, we're trying to find the area from negative 1 to 3, so we need to integrate from negative 1 to 3. And to find that distance between the two curves, we need to just subtract the two. Or in other words, take the top function, which is x squared plus 4, and subtract away the bottom function, which is x minus 2. If you can be successful in setting up these integrals, usually from here on out, it's not very difficult. Uh, the integrals we saw in chapters in the later parts of chapter 4 and chapter 5 were definitely more difficult than this, so don't overthink these problems. Uh, the one key you're going to have to keep in mind when you set these up is when you subtract away that bottom function, always put it in parentheses. Since we're subtracting a function that might have multiple terms to it, we need to put that in parentheses so that we can realize that we need to distribute that negative to both or to all the terms of the bottom function. So when you do that and combine like terms, we'll, we'll end up with x squared minus x plus 6. And again, don't overthink these integrals that you're going to see here in this chapter for the most part. Uh, sometimes they're very straightforward like this. There's no u substitution or any fancy technique we need here. We can just apply the power rule. x squared becomes x cubed over 3, minus x becomes minus x squared over 2, and plus 6 becomes plus 6x. We can put that bar, that evaluate notation, and then the bounds of negative 1 to 3. Now we can apply our fundamental theorem of calculus, where we take the top bound and plug it in, take the bottom bound and plug it in, and subtract those two values. Ultimately, I just want to show the whole plugging in process, since it's been a while since we've seen that. Um, but ultimately, just recall, you don't really have to show this step where you're plugging in the top bound and plugging in the bottom bound, unless it's going to help you kind of uh, do the math correctly and not uh, make a mistake. Uh, ultimately, the values that we need to show that we're getting are the final values. Uh, when you plug in the top bound, you'll get 45 over 2. When you plug in the bottom bound, you get negative 41 over 6. And now when we subtract those two values, or I guess technically add them since it's a uh, we're taking a minus of a minus, we'll end up with an area of 29.333. Okay, let's take a look at a few more examples here uh, so we can practice finding the area between two curves. Like you heard me say in that last slide, setting up a good looking sketch of the graph of the functions you're dealing with um, is kind of the key to making sure you set up these problems correctly. Uh, the setup is really everything uh, when we're dealing with these problems. Uh, without a proper setup, of course, the rest of the steps won't really matter much. So how do we find the area between the graph of x cubed and negative x squared minus 1 from 0 to 1? Well, let's again start off with a good looking picture here, which you can see. And then the next thing we're going to do is draw in that little representative rectangle. Again, that representative rectangle is standing in the place of the infinite amount of rectangles that we're trying to find the area of, and of course add those up, which we relate to a definite integral. So we always need to remember to take the top minus the bottom. That's going to be the key. The top function and the bottom function have to be identified so we can subtract those two. So our representative rectangle, the top of it, is touching x cubed, so that's our top function. The bottom of our representative rectangle is touching negative x squared minus 1, so that's our bottom function. And just like you saw in the last slide, 
we need to take the top function and subtract away the bottom function. And again, being very careful to put those parentheses uh, around that bottom function uh, since we're subtracting it. We're integrating from 0 to 1 because we're trying to find the area from 0 to 1. After you have this set up, it's uh, usually a fairly easy problem from here on out, especially uh, considering we've done uh, very hard integrals, uh, or much harder ones than this, uh, since we started uh, learning how to integrate. So the key here, so you don't make any minor mistakes, the common mistake here is to forget to distribute that negative. So we have to distribute that negative, which will give us x positive x squared plus 1. And now you can see a very easy integral. Don't overthink this. It's not a u substitution or some sort of other technique. Uh, we can just integrate each of these functions uh, separately um, and use that power rule. So we'll get x to the fourth over 4 plus x cubed over 3 plus x. And we need to put that bar so that we can show we're going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus using our bounds of 0 and 1. If we take that top bound of 1 and plug it in, we'll get 1 fourth plus 1 third plus 1. And luckily, when we plug in the bottom bound, all of those terms just become 0. If we add up those uh, values when we plugged in the upper bound of 1, we'll find that the area we get here is 19 over 12. In this problem, we're again trying to find the uh, area of a region. But what's different between this problem and the first two is they're not telling us from where to where to find the area. This problem is called a bounded problem because these two graphs are going to intersect, and where they intersect is the interval where we're going to integrate to find the area. So we need to know where the endpoints are for this region. And the endpoints are where the curves intersect each other. This is going to happen quite often in these problems where we're not going to know the bounds, so we're going to have to find where the endpoints are. And that's just another way of saying where do the curves intersect. So we're called back from algebra. To find where two graphs cross each other, we need to set them equal and solve for x. In this case, when we set the two functions equal to each other and solve for x, we'll end up with positive and negative 2. If we take a look at a picture of what's going on here, that definitely makes sense. We have a concave up parabola and a concave down parabola, and they're intersecting. They intersect at x equals negative 2 and x equals positive 2. So those are going to be our bounds. We're trying to find the area from negative 2 to 2. So we're going to go ahead and draw on that representative rectangle again so we can set up this interval properly. The top of that representative rectangle is touching the purple curve, which is 8 minus x squared. So that's our top function. The bottom of the representative rectangle is touching the green parabola, which is just x squared. So we have to subtract away x squared. Here, we didn't need to be so concerned with parentheses around the bottom function because it's just one term. But again, don't forget that bottom function should technically be in parentheses because we need to subtract away all the terms of it. But in this case, our bottom function just has one term x squared. Okay, uh, we can combine some like terms here. Negative x squared minus x squared is negative 2x squared. And again, we're left with a very easy integral. Again, don't overcomplicate these integrals. Uh, they're very straightforward in this manner here, uh, unlike the ones we maybe saw in chapters late in chapter 4 and chapter 5. So we'll add 1 to the power and divide by that new power uh, when we're doing the integral of 2x squared. The integral of 8, though, is just 8x. We'll put the bar notation and then our bounds of negative 2 and 2, so that now we can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus by taking the top bound and plugging it in. And when you do that, you'll get 32 thirds. You'll take the bottom bound and plug it in. And when you do that, you'll get negative 32 thirds. And we need to subtract those two values, which really means we need to add them. And we end up with an area here, in this case, of 64 thirds. Okay, so let's take a look at several AP test free response practice problems, and these are all going to be no calculator. So in this first problem, we want to find the area of R in the first quadrant bounded by the graph of y equals uh, 2 squared of x and the horizontal line y equals 6, and also the y-axis. The reason they need to mention that y-axis is that it needs to kind of be the other boundary in our little area here. 
So that's definitely important. So we need to find that area. So how are we going to find that area? Well, the first thing we should do is set up the integral. From where to where are we trying to find the area of? Well, be careful here. This x value is 9. This y value is 6. So of course, we need to integrate from one x value to another x value, so be careful. We're not integrating from 0 to 6 here. We're integrating from 0 to 9. The next thing we're going to do is draw in that representative rectangle. That rectangle will help us identify what the top function is and what the bottom function is because we need to subtract those two to set up this integral properly. The top of our representative rectangle is touching the function 6. The bottom of this representative rectangle is touching our other function, which is 2 squared of x. 2 squared of x is our curve here. But because we need to integrate this function, I'm not going to write it as 2 squared of x. I'm going to write it as 2x to the 1 half so we can apply our power rule. And that's the key here. Once we set this up, now we can apply the power rule because this is a very straightforward integral. The integral of 6 is 6x. The integral of 2x to the 1 half is 2x to the 3 halves all divided by 3 halves. Don't forget to put this bar notation or this uh, fundamental theorem of calculus uh, notation from 0 to 9. Okay, so we should definitely clean this up a little bit before we plug in the top and bottom bounds. Um, we're going to end up with 4 thirds or 6x minus 4 thirds x to the 3 halves. Okay, so now we're ready to apply uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus. We can take the top bound and plug it in. We can take the bottom bound and plug it in and subtract those two values. So the good news here is 0 doesn't contribute anything. When we plug in 0, we get 0 minus 0. So who really cares about that, so to speak? When we plug in 9, 9 times 6 is 54. Not a big deal. But how do we plug in 9 into this? Well, I didn't really have the space here to go over those steps. Um, but ultimately, the final answer is 18. But if you want to take a moment here to uh, figure out this uh, before I do it, it might be a good idea. Uh, these were done with no calculator. So how do we evaluate 4 thirds x to the 3 halves? Well, recall, 3 halves is just another way of saying to take the square root of x and cube it. And since we're trying to plug in the number 9, we're trying to take the square root of 9 and cube it. The square root of 9 is 3. 3 cubed is 27. What can we do now? Well, we know that 3 and the 27 can divide out. 3 goes into 27 9 times. So we have 4 times 9, or 36. So definitely some calculations uh, to get to that final value that you see here of 36. Uh, so just keep in mind all that practice we've had uh, simplifying our expressions and trying to evaluate them hopefully has kind of paid off now. After that, of course, again, the final answer is just negative 18 when you subtract those two values. Okay, here's another example. We want to, again, let r be the region in the first quadrant enclosed by the graph of 8x cubed and sine pi x. And we want to find the area of r. Again, be careful. This x value we have here where they're crossing is 1 half. So we need to set up an integral from 0 to a half because we're integrating from one x value to another x value. The next thing we need to do is figure out what our top and bottom uh, function are so we can subtract those two and then find the integral. So how do we figure out which one's which? Well, these functions aren't labeled here in this picture. You're going to have to know a little bit about the function 8x cubed and sine pi x so you can figure out which is which. So which are we dealing with in the top and which are we dealing with in the bottom? Well, if you recall, our function sine starts at uh, 0, 0 and increases up like this and then comes down and it's periodic. It'll kind of go up and down, up and down. Our cubic function, 8x cubed, starts at uh, the origin and increases up in this manner. So definitely knowing a little bit about uh, your parent functions and how they behave is going to be important here because this graph was not labeled in terms of which function is which. 
But now that we can see that the top function is sine and the bottom function is 8x cubed, we can set up this integral. The top of our representative rectangle is touching sine pi x, the bottom of this representative rectangle is touching 8x cubed, and of course we need to subtract those two. So now we need to integrate. Luckily, we're just subtracting these two integrals, I'm sorry, these two functions, so we can integrate them separately. The integral of 8x cubed, piece of cake, very straightforward. But how do we integrate sine of pi x? Well, we don't have a plain x inside of sine, so we have to call that u. The uh, derivative of u is du, and the derivative of pi x is pi dx. There is no extra pi over here in our expression, so we're going to have to take that pi and divide it over to the other side as 1 over pi. So the integral that we're going to end up with here is 1 over pi integral of sine u du. And again, we're just going to take these two integrals separately, so we're going to be subtracting 8x cubed dx. So the integral of sine u is negative cosine u, and the integral of negative 8x to the third will be negative 8x to the fourth over 4, and then we can put that bar and then our bounds of 0 and a half. We definitely need to clean this up before we start plugging in uh, the numbers to figure out what our final answer is. We can, of course, take this negative in front of cosine and move it to the front and plug the u back in. So we end up with negative 1 over pi cosine pi x minus 2x to the fourth. And be careful, this negative 1 over pi only applies to this term with cosine. It doesn't apply to the 2x uh, to the fourth, so be careful with that. Okay, so let's take our top bound and plug it in. When we take that one half and plug it in, cosine of pi over two is zero, which we have right here. And times um, uh, negative uh, one over pi is still zero. If we take one half and plug it into this piece, we'll end up with one eighth right here. Uh, when we take the zero and plug it in, be careful, zero uh, isn't always uh, produce a zero as a final answer. If we take zero and plug it into our first function here, the cosine of zero is one. One times uh, negative one over pi is negative one over pi. And then of course when we plug it in here, it just gives us the zero that you see here. Okay, assuming all that goes good and you can evaluate these numbers correctly, uh, we'll end up with just a final answer when we take those zeros out of negative 1 over 8. The minus and minus here become plus 1 over pi. Okay, here's another AP test for your response practice, but this time we're going to use a calculator. And in this problem we have two functions f and g. f is 1 fourth plus sine pi x, g is 4 to the negative x. R is the shaded region in the first quadrant that's enclosed by the y-axis in the graphs of f and g, and then S is the shaded region in the first quadrant also enclosed by the graphs of just f and g. So kind of the whole picture is set up for us, so there's not much to do there. We just need to set up these integrals and use our calculator to calculate these uh, answers for the area. So we need to find these two separate areas. Find the area of R and find the area of S. So let's take a look at R first, but before we do R, or before we determine the area of R, we need to figure out what our bounds are going to be. To figure out what our bounds are going to be, we need to find where these two curves intersect. And if you recall from a couple slides ago, to find where two curves intersect, we need to set those two functions equal to each other and solve for x. Luckily here, this is a calculator problem, so all we're going to do is just take this and type it in our calculator and see what it gives you. So definitely throughout these steps that you're going to see me covering in this problem, you might want to pause the video and see if you can get your calculator to produce the same answer. If you take this expression and type it in the calculator, you can see right here, I know I typed it incorrectly, and this is what the calculator will simplify it to be, but that's okay. It's just going to simplify it. That's not a big deal. The next thing we got to do is go to F2. And the first choice under that tab is to solve. We'll do second answer, put a comma x, and close the parentheses. If all that works out good, you'll find that the two values uh, that are 
uh, function crosses at or intersects at is at 61.0804 and 1.94167. You might be wondering if those are the right numbers. Well, you're going to have to be careful. Those are not the only intersection points. The reason I know that is there's a little arrow right here at the bottom, meaning there's more solutions to the right. So if you scroll over, you'll notice that there are two more answers, 1 and 0.178218. So be very careful. That could have been a big mistake you would have made if you thought the first two um, numbers you saw were the solution. But it actually turns out our solutions here are those two, the two smallest numbers, because they're the first two times these curves cross each other. So that's going to again be a 0.178218 and at x equals 1. And again, be careful. We want to keep all the digits in this decimal since this isn't a final answer yet. So we got to keep all those digits. Okay, now that we have the bounds out of the way, we can set up these integrals. To find the area of r, we will be integrating from 0 to 0.178218. Next thing we got to do is draw in that representative rectangle so we can figure out what our top function is and what our bottom function is. The top of that representative rectangle is touching the function g, which is 4 to the negative x. The bottom of the representative rectangle is touching our f function, which is the one with the sign in it. Again, you might want to pause here and take a moment and see if you can get this to work out. If we take the integral expression and type it in the calculator, again, that's what we typed, and that's what the calculator is going to simplify it to be. If you take this and type it in correctly, and then go to F3, which is calc, choose to integrate, you'll put second answer, which is uh, saying to use this equation. We'll put comma x, comma the lower bound of zero, comma the upper bound, which is the decimal. And again, if you want to pause and try this and see if you can get this answer, you should turn out, uh, or calculator should turn out an answer. 0.064753, but please keep in mind this is a free response question, so we have to round to three decimal places, so 0 0.065. Okay, once you can handle R, S is really just a matter of switching things up a little bit. To find the area of S, S exists from 0.178218 to 1. The other thing we got to do is figure out our top and bottom function. I'm going to draw in the representative rectangle. The top of that rectangle is touching F, which is the one with the sign in it. The bottom of our representative rectangle is touching G, which is 4 to the negative x. And again, if you want to take a second here to pause and try and make sure you can do this in your 89, probably a good idea. If you take that expression and integrate it with respect to x from the lower bound of 0.178218 to the upper bound of 1, all of that goes well in your calculator, you should end up with a final answer of 0 0.410362. But again, be very careful on the free response section. We want to round to three decimal places, so that's going to be 0 0.410 for the area of S. Okay, in this last slide, we're going to change things up a bit, so to speak. Uh, there are going to be problems we're going to run into where maybe that representative rectangle we've been drawing in that's vertical might not always work. So just as a quick recap, if you wanted to find the area of this picture, you can see our representative rectangle is touching the top green function and it's touching the bottom orange function, and we could set up that integral very easily. But what if I change things? so that it's not a top, or so that it's not an obvious, maybe, top minus bottom. If it's a top minus a bottom, we're of course integrating with respect to x. But what if we have a problem like this? Let's pretend I didn't mention anything a second ago about a different path we're going to take. If we were to try to integrate this problem, or to set up this problem, using what we've done uh, in the past few slides, we could, of course, put our representative rectangle right here, and we would see that it would be the green function minus the orange function, because that's the top and the bottom. But what if we put the representative rectangle here at the left side? Well, that would be green minus green. What if we put that representative rectangle on the right side, where it would be orange minus orange? Well, I guess we have conflicting things here. And that's kind of something I didn't mention uh, from before in the other problems we were looking at. 
when you put that representative rectangle in, as you move it across that area, it would always be the same top minus bottom. And that's kind of the key. You can see in this picture, as you move that representative rectangle from left to right across that area, it's not always the same top minus bottom. Whenever that happens, you're going to have to realize we're going to have to resort to doing a horizontal rectangle. And in those cases, we're going to do some, uh, something a little different, where we're going to take the right side of that rectangle minus the left side of that rectangle. And the key here is that we're going to int be integrating with respect to y. And of course, as soon as we do that and we kind of change things, that makes the problem seem a little bit harder. But it's the same idea. We're just kind of orienting things a little bit differently because our vertical rectangle just doesn't work. We have to resort to using a horizontal one. And now you can see, if I were to put a horizontal rectangle right here, it would still be orange minus green or right minus left. Here, if I put in a rectangle, it would still be orange minus green, or my right minus left. So as we move up and down with these rectangles, it's always the same right minus left, which is the proper way to approach that problem. So let's go ahead and set this up. What if we want to find this area that you see here? Well, this orange function I'm going to call f, this green function I'm going to call g, and we want to find the area from a to b or maybe b to a more appropriately in a sense. So uh, geometrically, geometrically speaking, to find the length of this representative rectangle, we need to take the right function and subtract away the left function, which would be um, f minus g. And of course, we want to integrate from a to b to find that area. OK, so like you heard me say from before, uh, you know, you can try to memorize that formula here, but I think the problem with memorizing this formula is that it's not always the right function being f and the left function being g. I think the better way to memorize this is to just use those words. We need to integrate from a bottom bound to a top bound and then uh, take a right function and subtract away a left function, and the key here will be do everything with respect to y. Okay, so let's attempt to do one of these problems. Uh, we want to find the area of the region bounded by the graph x minus 2 and y, x equals y squared. So if we take a second to graph those two, uh, we'll see that as the graph, and you'll notice right away if I were to try to do this problem from before, we could put a representative rectangle there and it would be blue minus red. And it would be blue minus red all the way up until the point where we got right here. We would have blue minus blue, and that doesn't work. It's not the same top minus bottom as we move across the area. So the only way to approach this problem is to use a uh, representative rectangle that is horizontal. Once we do that, we kind of just need to alter our perspective here and do everything in terms of y. So let's go ahead and find those intersection points. That's still kind of the fundamental thing we have to do with all of these problems if they don't tell us where these graphs intersect. So again, we're doing everything in terms of y, so we need to take this function and write it in terms of y, which in other words just means solve it for x, which is nice and simple, x equals y plus 2. So now we can take our two functions here of y squared and y plus 2 and set them equal to each other. That's a quadratic equation, so we need to set it equal to 0 and factor it. And then you can see what we kind of already saw visually is that these two graphs cross at y equals negative 1 and y equals 2, which are of course going to be the bounds on the integral that we need to set up. Okay, so how does the setup work? Well, unlike the vertical rectangle problems, we need to take the right function, which is touching the red line of y plus 2, and subtract away the left function, which is touching the blue parabola, or y squared. After you set it up, there's not much to do after that in terms of uh, the difficulty. I think the setup with a lot of these problems is really the difficult part. Uh, usually these integrals aren't usually too, too challenging. And this would be the case in this problem. The integral of y plus 2 minus y squared is very straightforward. We'll end up with y squared over 2 
plus 2y minus y cubed over 3. No u substitutions or any fancy techniques like that. We'll put our bar notation, negative 1 to 2, and now we can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. We can take the top bound of 2 and plug it in, which is 10 over 3. We can take the bottom bound and plug it in of negative 1, which will give you negative 7 over 6. And when we take those two values and subtract them, we'll end up with an area of this region of 9 over 2.